four, <laughs> three, <laughs> two. We're on. We are so on. Angela, you are on. I'm on. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know I, I love doing this. It's so like, look at me. I'm so important. <laughs> so important? <laughs> well, only when you jump on, then all of I'm automatically like. <laughs> <laughs> what happened to her today? I was going to say, um, if we had caught this tomorrow, uh -huh. my hair would probably be blue. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. It's sad. No, it's okay. No, I mean, no, 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 blue. <laughs> the other blue. There he is. I saw him a few minutes ago sitting there by himself. <laughs> oh, gosh. I told my crew to be on this. I showed up, asked if you were there, and then he left. I scared him. Uh, <laughs> not at all. I'm playing hide and seek. Yay! So we have Dr. Swirsky with us. Yay! Yay! Everybody's applauding from the privacy of their own home. That's it. <laughs> it's very exciting. Thank you so much for doing this interview with us. I am really excited. So, total pleasure and honor. And thank Yay. you. We have lots of questions for you tonight. Are you prepared? I hope not. I'm trying not to be prepared because I want to just answer right, right when I hear it. Just like okay. hearing yes. a song for the first time. You know, hearing yes. a song. <laughs> You're yeah. right. You're right. Okay, cool. So we're just like hanging out and stuff. And, yeah. and Angela, you'll help me look at the chat room and stuff. And oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just said hi. <laughs> I guess somebody had said hi. Oh, oh. Hi. <laughs> so I'd love to start off by just saying, hey, what you do today? Oh, what did I do today? Well, I picked up my son, and he's a fantastic producer himself. He's a 13-year-old boy who's now working with Lady Gaga's producer, and he's just making so much music. You know, he runs up to his room when he gets home, and it reminds me of when I was that age. All I wanted to do was go to my room, put on the needle on the my favorite song on the record, and put my headphones on. This is what you see right now is exactly what I was doing when I was eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. You know, it hasn't changed. It's it's music for me. See, what blows me away is that there is. A 13 year old doing this where there's so many electronics and so many distractions. Yeah. How do we keep our kids like not keep them? We're, we don't, yeah. you know, <laughs> ooh, them. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that, but how do they just gravitate towards, you know, being creative naturally? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question to pull that foot out of your mouth. Um, <laughs> you, it says, Edward wants to know, he says, you sound like you're from Great Neck. I don't know where Great yes. Neck is. Are you? <laughs> I'm, from, I'm from Great Neck uh, on Long Island. I was born in New Haven, Connecticut. And my, a, l a large part of my family is there. But I grew up on Long Island, you know, about 40 minutes outside of New York City. And that was a, you know, having that influence of New York right there, but also a very uh, kind of a bedroom community, very nice place to grow up. He's from Sheep's Head Bay. All right. <laughs> Fantastic. Very cool. Oh. Thank you. Cool. Okay. So, uh, well, I guess we'll move on to questions then. <laughs> <laughs> Since they're already asking them. <laughs> I know, right? You're prompting me. Um, so let's start like, okay, so you came into this world, you're already just gravitating towards music. What yeah. instruments um, did you gravitate towards like right off the bat? Well, I was born in 1960, and in 1962, I was born to two 18-year-old parents, and they were listening to a lot of the music of the day, Peter, Paul, and Mary, and Ray Charles. I very much remember hearing What I'd Say by Ray Charles and Blowing in the Wind, and there was a lot of music in my house from a very early age. By the time I was six or seven years old, in the mid to late 60s, I was begging my parents for a guitar. It was not about a piano, which I, of course I learned to play because it was in my house. And my brother took up the drum, so I had to be better than him. I mean, you know, any <laughs> instrument I had to play. And, but it was guitar for me. And it was guitar from about the age of seven or eight. And lessons, lessons, lessons. I couldn't get enough of playing guitar. And that's how it really started for me. It was all about the Beatles and guitar. 
Wow, so lessons didn't bother you. You you were okay like just learning basics and not just going straight to I want to learn a song? No, I wanted to learn the basics, but what they taught me very early on was they and this is I think so helpful to uh parents of kids who want to play. You learn chords and then you're also learning a song at the same time. So you're really hearing the uh you're getting the benefits of what you're learning at the moment when you're very young. So I learned a Peter Paul and Mary song very early. My first lesson, I learned an E minor and it hurt my fingers. You know what it's like to play guitar, you know, and, and just to change from two chords, an E minor to a D from, you know, you take a stick of bamboo, you take a stick of bamboo, you turn it into water. That was so big to learn that, you know, and uh, just if you can, if you can uh, make something out of what you're learning right away, that's very special. One other quick thing about that. About three years later, I'm taking guitar lessons like crazy, but I was at camp and there was a 19 year old teacher named Mike. I'll never forget his name, long hair. It's 1969 or whatever. And a 19 year old when you're 10 is like the biggest thing in the world, right? <laughs> and all this music's happening. And I said, so how do you play this and whatever? He said, listen, I'm not gonna tell you anymore. Get the second side of Abbey Road and put it on and just pick up your guitar and play. That's it, I'm not gonna tell you anything, just play. And that's, that was the world in many ways for what I play today. Because you learn, you start to anticipate what they're gonna do next. And when you can anticipate, that's how you become a songwriter. When I'm writing, I can hear what's coming around the bend. I, I kind of know what's on the next street before I turn on to it. So that was a big lesson from Mike. So thank you, Mike, if you're still thank out Thank you, there. Mike. Yay, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I had this weird thought. I go a lot from inspiration. Yes. And in a way, if you have these moments where inspired bits of song or whatever come to you, if you haven't learned the basics, how would you recognize them? <laughs> oh, well, that's important. Well, that's very, it's very important to learn the basics. It's like... I paint as well. And mm -hmm. imagine if you didn't have red and orange and green and yellow, but you want to paint something. Wouldn't it be great to just have those colors? So right. I always think to myself, learn more, learn the chords, learn these different things. You're, they're all colors. Right. They're all, that's all they are. They're just colors. They don't have to be, you know, there's not going to be any new discoveries of there's green and there's blue and there's C <laughs> and there's D and there's G minor. It's not. <laughs> You know, it's who you are that it comes right. through. That's why it's so. That's why Coldplay sounds different from um, Leonard Cohen or whatever. You know, they're using the same chords. Um, it's interesting I'm in photo classes because my background's in um, photographic mm -hmm. art, right? And yeah, you'd go on these field trips and you'd think this is crazy. We're all going to shoot the same thing, and then you'd right. see it in the class. And it's like no, no one has shot the same thing even the same way, <laughs> unless you have the obligatory. I mean, you're all going to do those um, tr whatever they are on Notre Dame. You know, yes. there's certain shots <laughs> you have to. That's, that's, <laughs> that, that's exactly right. I mean, really, was Diane Arbus's uh, camera any different from? Uh, you know, uh, right. name a photographer with, 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 with the paint that, yeah, right. Did, did Michelangelo use a different right. Right. paintbrush than Picasso? Did Paul McCartney? Is I mean, he played a bass guitar. You can pick up a bass guitar and you have, that's your palette. Right. So it's really who you are. I'm just- uh, It's what you do with of, it. I'm, I'm kind of commenting on you saying you have a certain inspiration and mm -hmm. I just say, learn as, get as many colors as you can. Right. Um, you, he says, you are one of the most amazing talents. I was over, I was over my daughter's album, and I see you wrote one of her hits. How did you accomplish? <laughs> Between his type and my reading, we're in trouble. <laughs> How did you accomplish all you have? I guess top-selling books, movies, and couple sports fan. I read your book, Pictures in the Night. I think it's something. <laughs> He's a fan. <laughs> oh, and, I, and I'm very flattered. Thank you. Thank oh, you. Yeah. I guess the answer to that question, <laughs> I'm trying to interpret the question, but I think I, I, I have a pretty good grasp on it. You know, I wrote songs for different recording artists throughout the 80s. And uh, 
I enjoyed doing that, but I was also restless. And then I started to get into baseball in the early 90s. I don't know why. It was a latent love of mine that I wasn't aware of. And when I wrote all these letters to baseball players, I would write it on my stationery, which was November Nights Music, Inc. And I would write to these guys. I would look them up, and they'd be 95 years old, and I would look up certain things about them. And I noticed that they pitched to Babe Ruth. Oh, wow. Or they, or they, or they, uh, they, they played on the same team as Ty Cobb. Na names that we would know. So that right. interested me that they were still alive. I wrote to all of them. They wrote back every day. I'd be getting 12, 15, 20 letters from these guys in their own cool. handwriting. So it showed. And, and I remember thinking, I can't do a book on this. I'm a songwriter. I, I can't do that. I don't know. Does it make money? Does it not? Does, what's <laughs> important to me? Can I, can I do this? And I remember that was a very key moment because I thought, forge ahead. This is another art form. And, and from that moment, I always felt, just keep forging ahead. I made a documentary with one camera, and, and I, 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 but I didn't question it anymore. Right. Because I just think that that's just another tool. A guitar is a tool. A camera is a tool. A paintbrush is a tool. These are all, I wake up every morning, I'm not sure, what is this going to be? Is it a song? When I have an idea, I don't know yes. how it's going to express itself. <laughs> but it's, it just does in some way or another. So that's the best answer for like how I make different art forms. I just, I'm not afraid to jump in the cold water because it warms up. Right. Well, There's a well. reason. <laughs> Gosh, that's inspiring. Very much. I, I've never heard of you before, actually. Sorry. And you've made well, a fan. I haven't either. <laughs> and that speech, <laughs> in that speech, you made a fan. Oh, I'm, well, I'm there. Right. There you go. <laughs> I love it. Really, it's fans. Uh, so, if I can, like, kind of back up now. So, we've mm -hmm. learned guitar. So, what came next as far as it's <laughs> just, oh, as, kind of Those like, tools. So, okay. <laughs> yeah, the tools. The tools. The tools. <laughs> well, you know, Lisa, it's funny because I, I started guitar in 67, 68, whenever it was, whenever the Beatles were everything, and they, they're still everything to me. But uh, it was about 73, 74, and Elton John was everything as well. And I loved Elton John. And I, I don't know if you hear it in my playing. It's very basic. I'm, I'm a pretty good piano player, but I'm not a, you know, I, I, I'm not as good as, you know, I'm, I'm a guitar player first. And I think it's because I was, I was ready to play the piano. I wasn't inspired yet to play the piano. I hadn't heard enough piano playing. I heard a lot of guitar playing in the late 60s. I didn't hear that much piano playing that I could pick out. And it was Elton John that kind of came along. And then I kind of had to play like him. And that's what happened with that. And uh, that just expanded what you can do. Do you know what I mean? Because... I write different songs on the piano yeah. than I do on guitar, you know? And if it's not happening on a piano, I go to my guitars. They're all in the same room. I just don't know which one is going to make me want to finish a song, you know? I think, yeah, and actually, um, I know I'm kind of jumping forward, but your last album, I uh, think Steve Reffling was saying, like, you were done with the album, and I'm probably not getting this right, but... And you were done with the album, then all of a sudden something came to you, and you went over to the piano, and, and there was another song. Was that right? Yeah, yeah. What happened on when I recorded my first album with Steve, which was Watercolor Day, the the album before this this record, Circles and Squares. Um, something just happened, and I I wanted to tie up all the loose ends of a lot of the melodies on the record, and. And I always try and do things that my heroes did. So you know how like McCartney would do a coda at the end and then he would bring in some other songs, you know, and they would kind of tie up. And I just started writing on his piano in that studio there and it just kind of kept flowing. Mm -hmm. It didn't all happen at once, but I wanted to record it as it was going. And uh, that's what kind of tied up Watercolor Day. And that's a very fulfilling feeling when you tie up the whole work, you know, because then it's like there really is a beginning and an end. It's almost right. like a, a Broadway show in a way where, you, where there's a kind of an overture and then there's the, the, the end that ties everything together. Did, did you guys see the one? Um, there's a question over here about and the Beatles documentary. And then he said Watercolor Days was amazing. Loved your tribute to Harry Nielsen. <laughs> oh, that's so nice. Uh, 
I saw Harry Nielsen's uh, documentary, the documentary on Harry Nielsen, I should say, when I was in the middle of making Watercolor Day, and I wrote it. Ah. It very much inspired me to write a song called um, about Nielsen. Of course, I can't remember the title to my own song. Anyway, <laughs> it was for the fans to go a, check out. <laughs> yeah, a very fun song to write and record because it was very much in his never style. Never met you, Harry. I never met yeah, yeah. you, Harry. In parentheses. <laughs> That's what always throws me off. Gotcha, about the I love that. parentheses and I yeah. love for it. I appreciate it. And thank you for keeping those alive. I'm yeah. sorry. Continue. Yeah, thank you. No, 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 no. It was a fun song to record because I never try to be like the art, like an artist that I'm feeling at the moment. You know, I have I have my 10 CC moments and I have my Nielsen moments, whatever, but I'm never really thinking about it. And it's funny because when there are reviews of my records, what happens these days, and I know you'll relate to this and you'll know this, there's, I think a lot of reviewers, they say things like, well, on the first song, that sounded a lot like, uh, you know, George Harrison and living in the material world. And that sounded a lot like uh, Graham Gouldman or, you know, all that stuff. They're looking for influences. Right. I'm just like, I'm just writing. I'm just recording. I'm just doing what I'm feeling at the time. So I I think they probably did that to the artists back then as well. Oh, yeah. You know, oh, there's Benny <laughs> Holly in that song. And there's, you know. Yeah. Now yeah, apply it so. to school in every literature class you've ever had. <laughs> right. <laughs> Exactly. Isn't that funny? See, and, and, and you're absolutely right, but bringing that to the awareness of, oh my gosh, yeah, wow. Well, well you know what? I don't, I don't think to myself, what would Paul McCartney do right now? Right. I, I don't, I don't, I don't think that I, I'm not, I'm not trying to copy a style. I'm just, right. I just do what I do, and I'm not really, I'm not thinking about. I think of an audience of one. I think is it, is it going to really thrill me when I put the headphones on? I'm, I'm sitting in bed with my headphones on, you know, in your favorite spot, and you're playing it, and you want to hear it over and over and over. That's all I'm trying to appeal to. If anybody likes it, fantastic. But right. I used to be a lot more afraid than I was. I'm just not feeling that afraid. Yay! Yay! <laughs> you know, it's really interesting. I've heard um, Stephen King, you know, it's a long time ago. Perhaps he has a different viewpoint on it now, but he was always writing to one reader, but the reader was outside himself. It was his mm. wife. Yours in being yourself is it's so much more healthy, actually. You can lose a wife. <laughs> you know what I mean? And careers well, can end. <laughs> yes, yes. I Well, you know, that's interesting you say that. I, I For people that have blocks when they're writing, I always say... Um, this, this relates very much to what you're saying about Stephen King and the outside right. person he's writing to. I always think like, what is the happiest, easiest time that you're ever uh, creating something? And you remember all when we were finger painting at let's say age six, let's say right. it's first grade or something. You know, they put yellow and green in front of you and you put your fingers in it and you just smeared it around and there was no judgment of it. <laughs> you know, it was, Elsie's right, eating hers. <laughs> Right? <laughs> but there was no judgment and you had fun. You exactly. had fun and there was no, you weren't judging yourself. So I always, I always say to people, if you have a block, it's because you have an adult editor in your mind at the same time. And you can't edit at the same time you're initially recording. So I actually say out loud many times when I'm just about to write something, I, I always say, editor, here's $10. I take $10 <laughs> out of my wallet. I said, now go to Starbucks, have a really good time. And you can come back at six or seven and you can judge it. But right now, I'm just going to finger paint. Nice. <laughs> Very That's nice. Beautiful. Wow. Look at you. Okay. I feel a book coming on that will help me. Okay. I have to know because somehow you prompted this, this, this inspiration question. Do you have any secret muses? You don't have to say who they are, but do you have any? For circles and squares, I had the strongest views I've ever had in my life. Um, I've written a lot of songs for a lot of recording artists, and I can tell you that I didn't... Uh, sound? Yeah, it's your oh, sound me. changed. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Can you, it's, do you, do you hear it's, me? There you go. It was yeah, it scratched. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> 
No, we just um, wanted to hear it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, miss anything. I can't even hear it because of the headphones. But, um, you know, I, I've written for lots of recording artists. I never really had a muse for writing for the Celine Dion's of the world and stuff like that. I never really, I just thought to myself, what would they want to be singing right now? What's maybe an, a unique take on things, whatever. But I met a woman about six years ago and I was so deeply inspired. I was so deeply in love that I found myself getting off my couch and just writing a song a day. It was, it was so amazing. And, and I re really remember thinking that at the time, like I've never experienced this. And it was, uh, I would say about six songs, six or seven songs on Circles and Squares are really about my relationship in as many uh, forms with her. And uh, I'm proud of them. I'm, I'm very proud, you know, the breakup moments and the, and the happy moments and the missing you moments, but they were, right. they were things I wrote that I'd never really written from that feeling before. It was written from a direct feeling. And it was, you know, it was a direct injection as opposed to imagining you know, a flower girl and you're running through the fields and I've written those songs, you know what I mean? Uh, but this was uh, really from a deep, deep place. So th I think that's what you ask, right? I mean, I, yeah, yeah. Do you have over here, he says, um, I hear your influences, You, um, your circle and squares is a perfect mix of the 10 CCs, McCartney, and you made it your own. And then he says, Michael, Michael McDonald, I think it was in reference to what you were saying. <laughs> yeah, um, I wrote a song for Michael McDonald back in uh, in the mid '90s, I think, or something like that. And I was so sure that it was going to be a big hit. I was so sure ah. of it. It sounded great. It was produced great, and it was a hit over in England, but it wasn't a hit over here. And it was on the AC charts and blah blah blah, and all good. And I'm happy, but. It was one of those that I really thought was going to make it. And then there are those that I never thought would be would make it. Look, my song for Taylor Dane, my first song for her, Tell It to My Heart. That's I what he had. <laughs> I, almost didn't, I almost didn't even give that to my publisher because I didn't really like it that much. You know, but it, it just goes it just goes to, the, to show you deliver everything. Write, finish everything. You know, right. just do it. So. Because it's getting sculptured by the next person. Is that maybe why? For the next well you just never know how it's going to turn out you know it's a good it's a good thing to just try and finish what you start is there a sense it's a little bit bigger than just you oh yes there really is there's a there's a fantastic <laughs> there's a tremendous feeling when uh, you're looking inside a restaurant and you hear your song coming out of it and you see people mouthing your words and you remember mm -hmm. where you were when you wrote them or even on not even that scale, just when you read a review of your songs or mm -hmm. your record and a reviewer beforehand wrote how much it's, I mean, I wrote, I, I read today where one of my songs on, on, on uh, my new album is, a, a t uh, is, is, very similar to being for the benefit of Mr. Kite from Sergeant Pepper. I'm thinking, <laughs> news to you. They, how did they get there? How did they, how did they get to that song? I mean, it's so far away from that. But it, it just tell you that the writer and the artist is a very is your you interpret your things differently than other people interpret them, and you're just one opinion. So right. when they when they ask. They, they could ask Picasso how he saw his paintings, for instance. He's just one opinion. Right. He's just one opinion. You think he's the ultimate opinion because he created Cause it? Because he did it, yeah. Because he did it, but he's just one opinion. It's just one. Dang. My head's going to explode. <laughs> this is so genius. So, so you mean all those photographs I threw away because they were going to end up in the thrift store? Bad idea. <laughs> Um, I, I think it kind of goes to that whole idea that you're doing, it's an audience of one. It's an yeah. audience of one. You create for yourself and however people interpret it, good or bad. I mean, I, I don't, I don't really think I'm better if I get better reviews or I'm bad right. if I don't. I well, just think, do I like it? And the flip side, I mean, that's where um, creators have problems is when they stop creating whatsoever for that audience of one. 
You know what I mean? When it's completely scripted by somebody else and you've stripped some joy out. <laughs> It's very true. In my 20s, I would have five different audiences in my head. I would think, will my publisher like it? Will my, the guy who signed me like it? Will the artist like it? Do I like it? Will my, <laughs> will my girlfriend like it? I mean, will my I mother too, like it? <laughs> you know, I, had too, I had too many opinions happening at once. And then as I got older, I realized, you know what? Yeah. I just want to like it because that's really, I can't please everybody. You know, I just want to please me. See, it's so true. And I think of spaghetti, like, you know, authentic spaghetti. Everybody has had that experience of the perfect spaghetti. And so they get to all judge it kind of in the same place. Yes. There's still going to be a little bit of conflict. Well, <laughs> East Coast versus West Coast. Yes. But yeah, it's isn't that interesting? You're totally blowing my mind tonight. Mm. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> and like it's not even back. messy. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, so let's see. We did um, guitar. We did keyboards. You must play more. Uh oh. He's well, got another. He's got another question. Right while we're oh, at yeah. a moment. Sure. Um, my oh, last my question: God. How did you have time to become a clinical psychologist with all you're into? Did you get this ambition from your mother, father, or both? <laughs> well. You know, my mother is very, I'm very, I'm very like both my parents. My dad is very kind of grounded, you know, he's a businessman, he's a very grounded guy. So like, I, I, I live in, I live a very kind of incredibly normal life, you know. Um, my mother makes, my mother is uh, amazing. She's a painter and she's a psychologist and she's a, she, she, she's written 12 books. She, she also played guitar when I was growing up. I kind of really am more like her in the sense that she just dove in the water. She just was not afraid to, to go swimming, you know? And I, I think I just kind of picked that up in a way. I, was, hmm. I would love to stay home from school and I would make, I would go to the, 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 the in the winter, I'd go to the heater and I would put my head up against it in the morning. I'd say, oh my God, I, <laughs> I have a fever. Just because I wanted, I wanted to stay home and play. I wanted to just, School was so regimented and... Jesus, we had the exact opposite <laughs> childhoods. I'm actually yeah. getting sick and swallowing the vomit so I don't have to stay home with that woman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love being home with my parents. I loved, um, you know, I got my master's degree about three years ago in, you know, clinical psychology. And I, I really, I like communication. I, I, you know, my books are based on communication <laughs> with baseball players. My Beatles movie was based on communication with people that were in the world of the Beatles and told stories. So I very much like, uh, it's very, uh, e it's, it's, it's something that comes easily to me, a, commun a communication type thing. As a matter of fact, my next book is coming out in April and it's called 21 Ways to a Happier Depression. Yay! <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so, yeah. It all goes through the funnel of creativity for me no matter if I got a degree in it or whatever I just I have it's got to come out creatively somehow oh it's funny because um, I said we had the complete opposite childhoods but we come from the exact same place in communication mm -hmm. because I've recently decided that I pretty much came out of the womb wanting to tell people things and I have never experienced a moment of joy in my life where within five seconds I didn't want to share it <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean so natural yes. communicator but very different mothers <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Yes. Okay, Elsie, you must have a question. <laughs> well, I'm only on my first question. That's scary. Oh. No, it's all good. I swear. Well, you asked about instruments, and I did the guitar thing and then the piano thing. And then, as I mentioned to you, my brother wanted to find a way to, you know, get some elbow room so he could play an instrument. He got some drums, but there couldn't be an instrument, an instrument in my house that I didn't want to play. And the interesting thing about that is <laughs> when I'm at... Right, and when I'm at the studio, I don't really like the first part of making songs, which is usually just putting guitar down. It's okay. not enjoyable to me. It's like it's like pouring the cement for a foundation for a house. I don't enjoy it though, and I don't really like the first few things that go on a song. But you have to do them. You have to do them. I, I don't really enjoy doing lead vocals that much at the beginning, but you need them as a guy that sometimes they made as the lead vocal and whatever. What I love doing is I love putting bass guitar on 
I love doing harmonies, love it. I love playing little guitar parts in between things. But my number one favorite thing is when I put drums down. I really love playing drums on my songs. More, almost more than anything. I mean, those other things are fun, but I just enjoy playing drums because it's not my main instrument, but I kind of want to, you know, try to see if I can pull it off. That's really the fun of it, you know? Wow. <clears throat> You've got a couple comments. He said, oh shoot, I am so into that because of the timing. I'm not sure what he was into, sorry. <laughs> um, if I didn't have all your albums after listening to you, I would, you were tremendous. There you go. <laughs> uh, well, that is, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. That's very, very kind. Thank you. You can get them all on Seth.com. <laughs> and I'll sign them. Woohoo. <laughs> hey, that's pretty cool. Okay. Um, so now we're going to talk about, well, let's see, the music you said you're really big on. You, you kind of give us uh, the Beatles, your, your early music listening. You uh, talked about Elton John. What followed after that? How did your musical taste evolve as you were growing up? Well, I loved all that stuff, and I thought the music of the 60s and 70s, I'm really a, a child of the 70s, mostly, but I thought that the music of the 60s, 70s, and 80s, up until about 1989, 90, 91, was very creative and very melodic. I'm, I'm, I'm melody-driven. I'm deeply melody-driven, to the point that I, I know when something gets me because when I hear it and it makes my eyes close, I actually am listening and then it oh. hits a certain point <laughs> and, and I just go like this. I find myself going like this. And, and I know at that moment, this is one of my favorites. And, and that's what happens to me. My it, music and melody go very deep to me. They're very, very deep. And, um, I just kind of kept listening to music throughout the 70s and 80s, and then I, I got a publishing deal, and I was writing for a lot of the artists that I grew up with, and that was a tremendous amount of fun. I, would, I remember I, I wrote a song for Al Green, and that, he, was a big, he was a big influence of mine, and I love I R&B love music. I wrote The Four Tops and Spinners and Smokey Robinson, all those people I grew up with, but it was just a flash ago in time that I remember, you know, I was in a in my green chair in my room growing up as a teenager, listening to those songs over and over and over again. And then just like, you know, when five years go by and you're out of college and now I was writing for these artists. And it was a great, amazing feeling to see your name on, a, on an album and then a CD and whatever it was. And that you're writing for guys that you love so much growing up and they're kind of singing your songs, you know? So that was right. very gratifying, obviously, you know. Cool experience. <laughs> yeah, I know your list is is very big on on people you've written for, and it was really really difficult for me to try to like collect all this just from the internet. And it's just it's a massive list. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I, I have a question then. Thank so it, since it's, really it's such cool. a wide list, right? And these are people that you grew up listening to. Um, so okay. w did we have one that really almost turned us fanboy? <laughs> I don't understand the question. Translate for me. <laughs> Meaning it was just too, you know, too much. It'd be bad because maybe you don't want to say, you know what I mean? <laughs> but it is interesting. Did you have the one that, you know, made you a babbling idiot? <laughs> oh, my God. Of, Al Green oh, or whoever. You know what I mean? Oh, oh you mean? <laughs> like oh, you, you mean, had just oh sat God. down with God. Yeah. <laughs> that's a, that's, a, that's a, a very good question. Um, well, my very first cover really was uh it really it really got to me because it's not that they were my favorite group in the world but i liked them very much because they had a lot of melody to them and uh it was air supply oh wow and so i was <laughs> you, you know i was 24 and writing songs and all of a sudden air supply is recording one of them and bob ezrin who did the wall he produced the wall for pink floyd and it was you know, it's really amazing to hear those voices. So you grow up and you're listening to the radio and then all of a sudden their voices are on your song and that, right. and their, and that record went gold right away and it was my first cover. And I'd wow. written it by myself. So I wasn't really, I'm not really a co-writer. I mean, I've written a lot of co-writes and Tell It To My Heart was a co-write and, <laughs> and, and there were a number along the way, but I always enjoyed writing myself a little bit more. I like that I did it. I don't know. Right, right. 
I mean, these days, a lot of people, there's seven or eight writers on a song. I don't understand why it takes that many people to write a song, but. <laughs> no, I'm you know. still trying to figure that one out. <laughs> and, you know, when you meant, when you say, like, which one turned me around, I was in a room a lot with a lot of mm -hmm. different songwriters that sometimes we didn't get covers. But it was, I was, you know, I wrote a song with Jerry Goffin, or I wrote a song with, uh, you know, there were a lot of very famous people that I grew up when they wrote some amazing things, but let's well, see. And, and even them, I mean, who was the one sitting next to, I think back in old thirties music or whatever, you know, if you were sitting next to Hoagie Carmichael or something where it's like, yes. Oh my God. Ah. Yes. <laughs> well, what I learned from writing with a lot of big name people was that they mm -hmm. are just songwriters like myself and they were searching for the missing lyric. Like I was, there was <laughs> just... nothing. Yeah. There was nothing so outstanding. I mean, they were, you know, you know, right. I, I mentioned the name, they, uh, you know, but they're just trying to do what I was doing, which is right. find that melodic piece and, you know, or, or that that great lyric or whatever. I'll tell you my favorite co-writer of all time that I've ever had. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I'm lucky. I'm a very lucky guy to, to have had this person as a co-writer. And wow. he's still my co-writer is Mike Rickbird. And we're we're in a band together. We, we have the, my other recording project is the Red Button. Ah, and okay. and we have this. It's almost like you could go through life having a lot of relationships, and then you find your wife. <laughs> Mike's yep. my wife. I'm sure, and, 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 I, nice. and I can be his wife. I'm just saying, we just have a fit that's, I, I you know, to use the Lennon McCartney. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the word I'm looking for is... Uh, yeah, what is that word? I It almost came to me, too. I know. Collaboration? Melding? Teamwork? Partnership? Yeah, they, they all work. I think you know what I mean. I'm not comparing. Yeah. I'm not comparing. Not a comparing word. Not a comparing word. I think word. my dad's exactly. soulmate was a dog. Yeah. <laughs> not soulmate, no. I know that word. We're both stuck. Ah. Chemistry. No. Edward says chemistry, and he would also like to know if you were influenced no. by Brian Wilson, and he says Red Button is a terrific power pot. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Yes, Brian Wilson, for sure. I would say my my biggest influences in the order of their appearance is the Beatles, Paul McCartney, John Lennon, George Harrison, Elton John, and Brian Wilson, in that exact order. So Elton John, Bernie Taupin. Bernie, not as much as a lyricist. Really? He's such, because he's <laughs> such a better lyricist than me. He, he blows me away. There's no, I can't. <laughs> I meant as a team. Oh, <laughs> well, Aren't the they kind thing. of a team thing, the same thing? Oh, they are, but in terms they of were? my influences, ah. I wasn't influenced by Bernie Top because by I could Bernie never I could never do what he does. I could I could never play as well as Elton John, but I liked his melodies and the way he played. Now, so wait a minute. I, you could never do. So did you actively look at it that way? You know, in writing, I had a friend that said they could never write and they stopped writing because they became too enamored of William Blake. I mean, did you do that yeah. with Bernie Taupin? <laughs> no, I never I never thought of it that way. I just kind of did. I do what I do. And then I look and then I say, well, you know, that's kind of a line that Lennon would use or that kind of twist. Right. But I never I never thought I'm going to do it like that. I, I have such high regard for Bernie Taupin. He and just talks all, different than that you do in terms of songs. I think he's special. I think he's very special. I think yeah. he's a true. I think he's a painter more than even a lyricist. Like he's a painter, like Joni Mitchell. The, the, they, they belong in their own category. That's nice. I oh, love that. God. I love that too. Yeah, yeah Joni Mitchell. I, I've tried to figure it out, and I'm like, nope, nope. Just enjoy it. <laughs> I like it. Wow, beautiful. So, anyone you'd like to? Um, co-create music with in the future that or you just, just kind of yeah yeah i love making my own songs but i love uh recording with like as a matter of fact the next red button record is coming out next year probably early summer and we've done seven songs right now and it's our best record we're so Yay. we're so we're <laughs> bursting with wanting to put it out but i put out i put out my solo record just you know a month ago so we can't really put out right. you know, stuff at the same time but we have a a unique chemistry. I I kind of bring the songs to Mike, and uh, he produces the red button. He's he, and you know, I play a few instruments on it. He plays a few things. We don't 
think, well, I've got to do that or I've got to do that to make it even. We know what we do well, like a good partnership in a marriage. We right. know what we do. Wow. We know what we do and it works and we're happy and we always have a good time recording. And, uh, you know, I think I bring a lot of the, uh, I bring a lot of melody to it. Not that he, he's a brilliant melodist himself, but he then takes it and kind of adds an edge that I don't have. He has a great little edge to him going, and it just mm. kind of we we even each other out, you know. And it's that's it's a lot of fun. It's a partnership, yes. Um, yeah. Edward has a question. Um, did you read the article in Rolling Stone about the making of Revolver? He said it's an interesting read. <laughs> I haven't read that. I know that Revolver came out on my sixth birthday, August fifth, nineteen sixty six. So that's what I know about. It. I know the songs, obviously. Wait a minute, and what year? <laughs> I was born. I was born in '60, but that came out in '66. You know, it came out on my birthday, so I remember. I'm actually that younger than you. <laughs> yeah. I I'm never younger than anybody, than anybody on this show. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. But he looks like a baby. I mean, oh, he does. He's adorable, <laughs> right? You. And you totally proved that music is the real divine youth. Yeah. The right. Thank you. Right? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. So cool. More applause. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> so dang it, I had something I was going to ask. Them. <laughs> I'm just about. totally okay. come out of my mind. <laughs> no, it's totally cool. That's how we're supposed to be then. So let's just. Oh, I know. I wanted to ask more about the red button <laughs> because when I was looking up other things you were doing, I assumed it was a project that once was, but you're saying it's ongoing. Still going. So when did it start and what's. Well, I was in the yeah. studio recording my first solo al album at the age of 44. I, I had written a song for Rufus Wainwright called Instant Pleasure, which was in the Big Daddy movie, uh, Adam Sandler movie. Yeah. And uh, I loved Rufus's version, but I thought, you know what, this would be a good beginning for my solo record. I, I want to record it differently. And I had a bunch of songs, so I, I wanted to try that. And. Uh, Mike came by the studio one day because he was friends with the producer. And uh, we hit it off. And I said, let's do a project. And we called ourselves Little Engine because we didn't think we could ever pull this up. The Little Engine. <laughs> the little engine is good. Yep. <laughs> and, then, and then we heard that there was a band in England with that name. And Mike then came up with the red button. And uh, okay. we put out our first record in 2007 or 8, something like that. And it just kind of hit. You know, before we knew it, we got a lot of orders for it. We got a distribution deal. It was like, I think we sold 12,000 records of that first Red Button oh record. God. And that's a lot in, <laughs> in this day and age. And the internet is right. kind of, that's a lot of records. So we kind of put ourselves on the map at that time. We were, we came in first on a lot of year-end polls for a lot of the, you know, the blogs that are out there and stuff. So we decided to do another record in 2011. We did another one and now we're doing our third and, as I say, we have such a good time recording that, you know, when things are fun and anything in life, right, you got to keep doing it. Uh, that's it. Yes. You know? <laughs> that is absolutely it. I'm yeah. so glad you clarified that because I'm serious. Someone like you, it's hard to find the facts on the Internet. Yeah. And having you here is oh. essential. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, <laughs> crucial in the facts. facts. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> oh my gosh, help me. Uh, okay, cool. Okay, all oh, right. So as long as we're on that subject, I'm not actually six feet. I'm 5'11 and change. <laughs> but if you're over 5'11 and you don't say you're six feet, then like, what good is it? What good is it? Yeah. Interesting. Again, <laughs> that makes sense. Wow. You wanted the facts. <laughs> you wanted the you facts. Want the facts. <laughs> you want truth here. <laughs> right? Okay, good. Mm. I'm so glad you clarified. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, let's see, what has, okay, maybe we've touched on this, maybe we haven't. What has been your most proudest moments as a musician and a songwriter and a creator? Wow, that is, that's a, that's a real, I think, I think when, you know, when, when I, when I wrote with Ernie Gold, the song Tell It To My Heart, it was not, I wrote, we wrote it for Madonna. She, it was a big, she was huge in the late eighties and whatever. And what you do as a songwriter, you write for the, the top. And then if they don't do it, you go to the next year and the next year and the next year. But if it's a good oh, wow. song, somehow they'll make it, right? 
And before I knew it, there was uh, this artist named, her name was Les Lee. She wasn't Taylor Dane at the time. And I heard a demo recording of her doing it. And it was like, wow, this is the best cover I've gotten. And I had songs at the time that were, you know, as I say, Air Supply. Other big artists had done these songs. And she wasn't anybody at the time. I didn't think anything would happen with it. And it got a deal on Arista Records, whatever. I fly out to San Francisco. I was living in New York with my girlfriend who became my wife. And we land in San Francisco. We rent a car. And we're driving to our hotel. I'm 27 years old, whatever it is. I turn on the radio and tell it to my heart is, is on the radio. That was such a moment. That was the first time wow. I heard that song. And it, you know, oh. it went top 10 and it was just a, a thrill. Well, cut to about, I don't know, I, I wrote her second hit too called Prove Your Love, which also was top 10. So I'm riding high. I'm a signed songwriter and my contract was coming up. And they were whining and dining me a little bit. And it was obviously a thrill. I'm in L.A. And somebody from my music company, Warner Chapel, said, listen, we want you to meet somebody upstairs at uh, some restaurant we were at. And I went upstairs. And they said, uh, Seth, meet George. And George Harrison turns around. And I'm, I'm thinking, I'm really meeting a Beatle right now. I'm really meeting one of my great <laughs> idols. And I, and I said to him something like, I, I tried to keep my composure. And I said, um, George, you know, we're on the charts right now together. You have the, Your song, Got My Mind Set on You, and my song is Tell It to My Heart. And he says, oh, my, my son Danny he loves that song. I, I didn't know. You, you wrote that. It's, it's wonderful. And I'm thinking I'm uh, like talking shop. <laughs> I'm talking. <laughs> he goes, hey, guys, he goes, I want you to meet some of the guys. He goes, this is uh, this is Tom, and this is Bob, and this is Roy. And I met the Traveling oh. Wilburys before nice. the record nice. came out. Well, then it, it, oh. it turns out that two nice. weeks later, I, I was at the Grammys because Tell It To My Heart was up for not as a song, but she was up as a singer of that song. So I was at one of the after parties before the party started, right? And the room was fairly empty. And I look up at the front. This is two weeks after I met George Harrison. There's George again. So I'm thinking, yeah. okay, my new best friend. And <laughs> George starts it. walking to the middle of the room. And I start walking. And I said, hey, George. And he goes, Seth. I'm thinking, <laughs> he remembers my name with the, with the millions, billions of people he's met. And I said, I said, you know what? What are you, what are you doing this week? Do you want to write a song? Let's write a song. And he goes, you know, I'm actually working with Bobby on Fridays. So I got turned down for Bob Dylan, and I'm happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't go proud. There are right? much worse ones. That's yes. okay. That's okay. Um, Wow. So Randy still listens and loves um to t loves tell it to my heart and Edward Herman says it's a great story loves it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so That's much. so cool. And I think your sound yeah. went again. <laughs> oh, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Am I back? Okay. <laughs> Better. Sorry. <laughs> cool. Oh, I like that. Okay. Um Thank you. Oh, okay. So if you weren't a musician, I, this is a very, very bizarre question, probably. <laughs> what do you think you would have done had you not just become a successful musician? Oh, well, that's an interesting question. I always wanted to be a musician, and I never considered anything differently. And I had parents that never looked at a report card. I ended up going to college. I ended up, you know, doing what people do. But I never, uh, it never crossed my mind not to do that. You know, I just kind of had a strong vision, and it, 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 I was fortunate that it, it occurred. But at no point did I ever consider anything else. So the question is, what would I do differently? I don't know. Maybe all the, the, other, maybe the other things that I did. You know, I, I, I don't know anything other than just making things, creating. So maybe I would have right. done books, you know, uh, uh, but that's what I'm and doing. Right. Yeah. And I, you know, now come to think of it, that's true. I mean, you've got your degree. Uh, you, you're, uh, you've done documentaries. We'll get to those. Yeah, you, you kind of are doing lots of other things besides for being a musician. So, <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, okay. So here's a question I'm personally interested in very much. 
when you write a song, do you hear it already completed in your head? Or do you just let what's coming through you take over? Yeah. And you know, songs are the most mysterious art form. Because with a movie, you have a shooting script. And with, you know, all most other forms of art, you kind of know, usually with many painters, they have a subject sitting in front of them. I find with songs, it's very, very different. It's, you have to have a certain amount of openness at all times. You have to know that you don't know what's going to happen. So you kind of have to be, I, I, I said this earlier, you can't really be afraid to go to a diminished chord or to go, whatever. You got to just sing nonsense lyrics as it goes. And you got to trust that what you're hearing, you're liking, you're liking. I could write 20 melodies right now and I might not like any of them. So they're gone in the wind. Maybe one of them would have been a hit. I don't know. I don't really care. It's more like I just want to like what I'm playing and singing at the time. And it, and it takes you and you take it. So it's a little bit of a marriage that happens at the same time. But it's a fun journey. You know, so I, I kind of let it happen as it goes. I, I, there's no formula for it. There's no formula. I sit down. It's almost like a feeling. If I'm, if I'm in a certain mood, there's got to be a number of things that happen that makes me feel in a certain mood. And then a song comes out. Or, or it doesn't but I don't fight it. I'll tell you one other thing that's interesting. When, when, when I started painting about 20 years ago, I noticed that every time I'm, in, I'm stuck, in a song, if I'm stuck in the middle of a song, I don't fight it anymore. I go to a canvas and mm. I just start painting. And what that does, if I'm mi missing a lyric or a, you know, a, 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 cert, a bridge for a song or something, what it does when you're painting, you're still being very creative. But you're not thinking at the moment of that song. It goes to your secondary person. It goes to a subconscious place. You're working out that lyric in another part of your brain that's not, you're not conscious of it at the moment. And then I always go back and it seems to come out. So paintings kind of, for me at least, they're, they kind of grease the wheels a little bit without me being hard on myself saying, work and work and work at it and get it. I mean, you do have to do a certain amount of work, but you know, it's kind of nice when you can go to another art form and it helps you with the other art form. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. And there's this thing that, uh, I don't know, Angela, if I could use you in this, uh -huh. that when we're, when we're uh, focusing on, on manifesting something, you visualize it and then you let go, mm -hmm. let it go. Yes. <laughs> and then it, it just falls off. Cool. Thank you. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, okay. We're going to get back to music, but I want to take a little curve because, you know, I know you just love that. We <laughs> Beatles stories, yeah. the full length documentary. Can you tell us more about what that is all about? Well, I was in uh, Liverpool. Uh, David Bash, who does the international pop overthrow asked me to play at one of those uh, events and uh, I thought wow to play my record live at the Cavern Club now I know it's not the same Cavern Club it's down the block on Matthew Street but to be in Liverpool pretty cool how, how amazing <laughs> right and I packed you know some clothes and my guitar and I threw my video camera in there at, at you know before I left and when I was just walking the streets in Liverpool I would notice that people had a story about the Beatles here and there. And I thought I knew everything, you know, I thought I knew every, you know, but I, I realized I didn't know anything compared to some of the, 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 some of the deeper stories. So when I got back to Los Angeles, I looked up May Pang, who I knew in, in music publishing at one time, and at least I could make a connection, but I didn't know her. And I wrote her a note. I wrote her an email. Simple as that. And I said, if you're ever in Los Angeles, I'd love to film some stories. Well, she said, I'm going to be there in two days. So I picked her up at where she was staying. and We drove to every place her and John Lennon lived when they came here in 73. And I thought, is this the story of May and John? Is this 
what is this? What do I have on film here? And I didn't know. And then I, I heard that the Moody Blues were playing in Las Vegas. And I thought, wow, I'd love to meet Justin Hayward. I love the Moody Blues. So I pitched his manager and I said, May Pang has already done it. And they said, well, Justin wants to meet you before the show. And that's what you actually see on film. He's in a hotel room. And, and before I knew it, I was in England and I got picked up at the train station by Norman Smith, who was the Beatles' longtime uh, first engineer. He was the guy that actually made the sound. He recorded 110 of their songs. Hmm. And the point I'm making is that I just found people that have these delicious little stories. And it gave me a chance to meet everybody I wanted to meet. Felix Cavalieri from the, you know, the Young Rascals and Art Garfunkel. I was in Art Garfunkel's apartment. Here I am like, there's Art Garfunkel. After the interview, he says, come down into my den. I go down to his den. He starts rolling a joint. And I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm, I'm smoking a smoke joint with Art Garfunkel. <laughs> so we start smoking a joint. And he's like, he's like, do you think? Do you think I was as good as Paul Sundman? What do you think in terms of and I'm and I'm like, I'm smoking, I'm saying, you know, you were the Monet of voices. You know, we just went into this whole thing talking about the mamas and the papas and how they compared and all these things and all the experiences that happened with meeting all you know, George Martin and so many, you know, the guys that were in the quarrymen and 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 Sir Ben Kingsley and and John Voigt. I remember I filmed John Voigt at the Beverly Hills Hotel on a bench there. And, and the manager from the Beverly Hills Hotel came out and he looked at me. He didn't see John Voigt. And he said, you're not allowed to film here. You're not allowed to do it. He really, <laughs> he really scolded me. I mean, it's on film. It's not in the movie, but it's on film. And then all of a sudden, John Voigt gets up and he looks at me. He goes, hey, Tom, how you doing? And he goes, oh, Mr. Voigt. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Voigt. Was so great. I didn't know you were Oops. I mean, so, like, I think to myself, I directed Ben Kingsley and John Voigt in, in a movie, you know? <laughs> Just fun stuff, you know? When you're doing things you enjoy, great things happen, you know? And did you even think that, that these are, like, things that would never be exposed had yeah. you not just entered that world mm -hmm. and... and Oh my gosh, that well, stuff could be buried forever. Well, you know, I want to say one quick thing about that. When people say, what do you do? Like on a real deeper question, I, I, what I really am is I love making collages. I love cutting and pasting. I love <laughs> taking things out of magazines and then pasting them. I, I love doing that as a kid. That's what I did with Beatles stories. I just found, I, I interviewed a whole lot of people. It wasn't, the fun of it wasn't setting up a camera. That's the least fun of it. You know, that's, that's the most nerve wracking. But what I loved doing was, okay, Art Garfunkel's interview goes great with, uh, you know, uh, Graham Nash, when I interviewed Graham Nash. Like, wow, the juxtaposition of those interviews, one led into the other. It was really making a collage. And it's yeah. the same as when I make records. You know, I, I love when I have all the songs at the end of it to think that would go great here. Now, you know, as well as I do, that these days people say when they listen to your CD, if they ever even listen to a CD, because it's not a no one has a player anymore. They'll say, I love song 11. They don't even maybe know the title. <laughs> I, don't, yes. I don't look at it that way. I look at it as I'm making a collage. I'm making records the way I grew up listening to them. And I see them as a larger piece of work. So that's what happened with Beatles stories. I just interviewed 100 people. I chopped it down to 50 interviews. Before I knew it, it was in 20 film festivals. And now it's, it's now playing all over the world in different, you know, it's on the arts channel in, in, in England. Oh, sorry, cool. So every time it plays there, I get all these emails from British people. <laughs> it's just a wonderful feeling to yeah. know that that is going on as well, you know? So there's a little bit of a sordid thing beginning to happen with you now, Edward, I've got to say. He says, <laughs> um, he um, he did something bad in a store I worked at, Gar Gar Garfunkel did, and he wants to know if there's anything you learned about the Beatles that shocked or surprised you. This on oh. the tale of Art Garfunkel, I don't know. You might oh, not yeah. want to go there. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know about his personal life or anything like that. He was awfully nice to me, and everybody really was. I mean, people invited me into their homes. Before I knew it, I was in... Uh, what was the guy that was uh, 
who played Fonzie? Henry Winkler. Oh, Henry Winkler. Yeah. And when he agreed to do this, because I kind of knew his story, and I thought it would be amazing to put in this movie, and he invites me over to his house in Los Angeles, and you know, you make a left and a right, and you, you're at his house. <laughs> and there he is, and it's just, he's just a guy, you know? I mean, with he's just a person telling a great story, and we could only get stories about the Beatles. Let's face it, after they stopped touring, they were really closed up for four years. There were no, right. you couldn't really hear these things. So... I just tried to make something that you might watch in a hundred years and say, you know, we didn't know that. We know we know that from that. Right. You know? right. Hmm. Powerful. Hmm. Is there something else here in the chat? Oh yeah, he just yeah. I worked in Herman's Sporting Goods. He stole weight bars. Our security chased him. Oh. <laughs> Wow. Okay. I don't that's a visual. Yeah. Yeah. Are you sure it wasn't too. just a lookalike? <laughs> Either way, well, it's still know, a good visual. <laughs> that's funny. Uh, oh my god! I love that's all I know, and um, oh, yeah. no one knows that song. Oh my god! What a song! You know who wrote that song? That same guy who wrote, uh, you know, that uh, Jim Webb. Oh, who wrote okay. Arthur Park and Up, Up and Ooh, Away, wow. and uh, and and. Um, Girl, I know you're getting married. Heard you're getting married. <laughs> yeah, that was a, a big song, people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, I think I know that one, but I like how you say that. Yeah, so, <laughs> Jim, Jim Webb is a very huge, fantastic, and another league of his own songwriter. And he happened to write that song, All I Know, as well, which is a fantastic song. Oh man, that song just like gets me every time. Just so great. Uh, okay. Oh, um, oh, editing. <laughs> yes. So, how do you do? You do you like cutting and pasting? That yes. must mean editing does not drive you crazy, right? When it come yeah. when it came to doing my film, I love editing in a recording studio, but you know I I record with Steve Steve Reffling, and he's just so good. I don't have a recording studio at home. I used to have one, I don't really, I never really used it because it took away from my songwriting. And this is the example I'll, I'll give you. When I'm sitting with an acoustic guitar on my couch, that's when a song takes place. But I noticed when I started to record it, there would always be like, why isn't the left channel happening? Or why is there too much treble? Or why is there this? Before you knew it, the inspiration was gone. Mm -hmm. So I really made mm -hmm. a decision before I made my records back you know, 10 years ago, whatever it was, I'm not going to record anymore. I am just going to get the ideas done and hone what I do best, which is writing songs. And then I'll get a great engineer with his own studio that knows that I like to call the shots out. And I, I really call them out kind of quickly, like that bass needs to come down. I like to mix as I go. Okay. okay. Very much like cool. to mix as I go. And so I don't, you know, I could... A, a record could come out three years after I start recording it, but I might listen to that song a year or two in, but we're up to the part that I'm already liking the way that mix is going, if you, if you know what I'm saying. So I absolutely mix as I go, and uh, Steve is a fantastic editor of that. When it comes to movies, I always hire a guy named Mike Pope, who is a fantastic editor. He's a young guy that knows how his hands move very quickly. I think you know what your strengths are. And my strength is yeah. I, I see it and I know it. I know what I want to see. I know how I want to experiment. I do not want to do it on my own. I don't want to learn it. it. It's all there to be learned. And I, and I applaud people that really learn it. I really do. I think it's fantastic. I just would rather take my own money and pay people who know how to do that stuff. Because I just need to kind of sit back in an old-fashioned way in a director's chair or in a recording, you know, booth when I'm playing and I want to hear something else. I don't want to have to concentrate on the uh, logistics. I just want to concentrate on the on the larger vision. Cool. Nice. Good answer. Very cool. Um, Angela, anything while I look for my next No, one. but I'm going to have to go soon. <laughs> that's fine. You just, that's totally cool. Feeling like a little um, rascal or something. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, no. no, I know it's, it's yeah, she's yeah. got some 
thing. Plus, I've been eating. I'm getting hungry. <laughs> oh, we, <laughs> All right, okay, then I'm so, going to say goodbye then. Bye. Well, I, it was lovely you. meeting you. You're such a handsome man and so talented. Oh, and I'm definitely going to go buy every one of your albums oh, as soon as I've eaten. <laughs> so nice. Thank <laughs> really you so am. much. <laughs> I appreciate it. See thank, you for, thank you for your big question. Okay, thank see you. See you, Elsie. Love you. Bye. Uh, okay, so The Last Giant, a short oh, yeah. film of yours that yes. inspired you. Well, I started collecting baseball memorabilia in the mid-90s, and I really got into it. And before I knew it, I had the ball that went through Bill Buckner's legs in the 86 World Series and the the home run that Babe Ruth hit to make him the, the all-time home run king. And I just got into baseball. When you get in, When I get into things, I go – kind of all the way, you know, and I had a few jerseys, baseball jerseys. I had Lou Gehrig's jersey. I had a few jerseys that I was so proud of. I was like, they wore this. They actually wore this jersey on the field. And, you know, I'm a romantic. So I think to myself, what was the field like in 1932? It was, didn't even have lights. Imagine going to baseball games in the middle of the day. Imagine what was life like? It would, these objects really were like time machines to places I had never been. Anyway, I ended up getting a jersey of a, of a man named Harry Danning, who was the catcher for the New York Giants in the 30s. And I realized that he was alive. He was in his you know, late 80s. And I wrote him a letter and I said, listen, if you ever come out to Los Angeles, I'd love to meet you. Well, there was a knock at the door and the six foot four, 89 year old man knocked on my door. Oh. So I got a video camera. I said, Mr. Danning, oh my God. And he sits down and I, I would ask him questions like, what was it like? He was a catcher and a catcher sits behind the batters, right? And they catch the ball when the pitcher pitches it. I said, what was it like to be behind Lou Gehrig? The great Lou Gehrig. I mean, his name is gonna go down, you know, and he goes, oh, Lou was a nice guy. We would always talk when he used to come to bat. I would ask about his family, and he would ask about mine. It was so – to learn about the real things that were said between the legends. And at the end of the interview, I said, Mr. Danning, I have something that you haven't seen probably in 60 years. And he said, what? I said – and I, I brought out his jersey that he wore, and it had his name on the back. And I said, would you sign this? And he signed it with his, uh, his nickname. And he wrote, Harry the Horse Danning. Oh, God. And, and that little film, which was just, it was not well lit. It was nothing like that. But I put it together, and it was 17 minutes long. It was the first time I'd ever really filmed anybody outside of my family. And I just sent it to the Washington, D.C. International Film Festival, and they took it. And it played in front of this huge audience, and it was, you know, it was up as the finalist for the doc, you know, a short documentary thing. And it was just the, you know, it was just one of those things, Lisa, you do because it's there to do, and why not do it, and why not see it through, you know? And it, yes. it became something, and I'm very. That's one of the. Thank you for asking about it. I'm never asked about that, and I love that particular moment with this great man. Oh my gosh! Another great contribution to the world too. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, now we get to in 1999. You were featured in a PBS documentary, mm -hmm. "The Passion of Clay," about your eclectic life. Yeah, they're they were doing a, a documentary about four people's lives. One of them was Steve Wynn, who owned uh, the all those Las Vegas hotels, but he was also a collector. Yeah of, uh, you know, great art. And so I was uh, gonna be bidding on something at Sotheby's in New York and they wanted to follow me as I went, got on the plane and held up my bidding pal, you know, mallet and yeah. all of it. <laughs> and it was just like but... this crazy thing. And I turn on PBS or KCT out in Los Angeles and uh, it was just a thrill that they chose me to be somebody that they, wanted to, you know, uh, that exemplified to them how passion can turn into a hobby and, a, and, a, and, and things that you enjoy doing. So that was, uh, obviously I was thrilled and 
you know, honored. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, because that one, I was trying to look it up. I'm like, I don't get it. I don't get right. it. So, <laughs> wow, I love that. And I actually love the wind. I usually only get to walk through it, though. Yeah. Oh, I once saw this guy in this, like, fabulous suit. Mm. And he left the tag on. <laughs> it was so cool. That is cool. I was cool. like, oh, my God. <laughs> um, okay, so let's see. Now uh, let's talk about your – your. okay, we talked a little bit about Watercolor Day. This was your second solo mm. album. I may be all over the place here. Uh, when was your first – your first album. My first album was Instant Pleasure. That was 2004. Right. And then Watercolor Day was 2010. And now Circles and Squares is 2016. So I think there's a pattern here. It's every six years, mm -hmm. there's a solo record. Okay. And every three or four years, there's a red button record. So wow. I think about, you know, 12 years and almost six records of all original material. I'm very proud of that. That's cool. How come it took you a while to get to your first solo album after being a songwriter? I don't think I believed in myself as an artist. I think uh, I, I did things as I believed and I didn't, it took me 44 years to kind of feel comfortable enough to do that. And I had a producer, a lot of famous people played on my record, guys from the band uh, Beck uh, and uh, so many, you know, so many different L.A. great musicians. Dorian Crozier yeah. produced it, and he just knew so many guys, and they were into the stuff and, and all that. But I didn't get to play as much on that record. I played, but I didn't have a free, as free a hand as I wanted. And I think with Watercolor Day, I, uh, I got together with Rick Gallego of Cloud 11. And it was a great collaboration. We co-produced that record. And then at the end of that record, he said to me, you know, your next record, you have to do all on your own because you can do it. So it's a progression. And I always feel as if I want to take shots with the next thing I do. I always want to be, I always want to do something I'm a little afraid of, you know? Okay. I don't want to just do the same thing again. I mean, I, you know, I write two and a half minute pop songs or three minute pop songs, but I don't, I try to do different things with them as I progress in life. You know, I want to try things that I haven't done. Cool. Yeah. With this, um, Circles and Squares, this came out... Um, in August, late August. August. Yeah. And was it just one of those things where you're like, okay, I have all these songs, I'm ready to go in? What was the process? Well, it started with, I, I think I mentioned to you this relationship I was in, and I was writing all of these songs that related to that but there were too many romantic songs and so then i branched out and was writing about how i paint which is actually the title song circles and squares i start with large circles and squares and then i fill it all in as it goes and then um other okay. songs that were you know one song is about my panic attacks over the years it's called sonic ferris wheel and it that's what they feel like to me that's what they really actually feel like. Like I'm just spinning on this thing where I, that I can't get off of. So yeah, and I'm kind of laughing, but I totally relate. Like I get that, and yeah. it's beautiful, though. Oh, thank it's you. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. So it, it it got filled in. It started really with a lot of romantic songs, but it got filled in. It got dotted with other diary entries of things that go on in my life. You know, painting and painting and panic attacks. <laughs> not literally. Uh, not not, not literally, out. right. <laughs> not only. Okay. Uh, and speaking of artwork and your painting, do you actually do anything with that? Well, there's a big restaurant in Los Angeles that has a huge walls, and they've been, they've asked me if I would do a show. And I, it, my, my paintings are very large. And so I think that I'm going to be doing a show in the spring of a lot of my paintings. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. How exciting. So I'll, okay. I'll post that and whatever. But uh, it is very exciting. Uh, you know, in between albums, right? Oh, it is like... <laughs> you know, I, I'm just fortunate that oh, I, oh. I have the time to do it and I can. You know what I mean? Uh, so, so exciting. Yeah, yeah. Everything... 
everything makes everything else better. You know what I mean? It, it, everything makes everything else better. Yeah, wow. I just love that. Yeah, it's just when I create one thing, it makes something else better because mm. I, I, I learn from the one thing I'm doing and I bring it into another thing. I bring it into another field. Like um, my book that's coming out in April, as I mentioned, it's called 21 Ways to a Happier Depression. It's not really about depression. It's not deep and dark. Right. It's right. an it's right. a, it's an art book, really, and it's it kind of came about because of the other things I do. I, I wanted there to be a book that was not so heavy and deep, but that when you look at it, you feel somewhat comforted because it. Oh yeah. It's a bunch of things that alleviate that very high tension feeling. So it's not clinical at all. It's very personal and kind of creative. So that's what mm -hmm. kind of comes from doing the other things. You know what I mean? Yes. Well, I know I'd buy that book, by oh. the way. Anyway, it, it definitely, yeah. And I'm just, I just, yeah, my mind just goes, ooh, it's, you know, pretty. <laughs> you know? Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. Thank you. In other words, one day, if you ever see my library collection of books, maybe it will make more sense. <laughs> um, okay. Anyway, the inspired musician right here. Uh, what was this is like some really fun questions for you because I think we have about 15 more minutes okay. left I'd love to have you for like four more hours but <laughs> it kind of shuts off after like right. 90 um, so what has been the greatest concert or live performance that you've ever been to well there have been many obviously I think a lot of people would say that they've seen many great concerts but the one for me was in 1976 seeing Wings Over America. Uh, seeing Paul McCartney six years or five years after the Beatles broke up around that time and knowing that he was 200 or 100 feet away from me and I'm 15 years old, it was, it was, wow. it was beyond anything that I could actually imagine. I've seen some great concerts. ELO in the mid 70s or 77 oh, was great, lucky. you know, and Madison Square Garden. And I happen to be seventh row. I never had great seats, but I just happened to see them. I love seeing bread live back in the day. Wow. I saw I can't even imagine. Right. It was really <laughs> so fantastic. El Elton John yeah. was incredible to see back in that time. Um, I really saw a lot of great artists at that time. And the artists that I haven't seen, I haven't missed. I never saw the Rolling Stones live. Now, I like the Rolling Stones, and there was a certain pocket of time, 69 around, that I really liked their stuff. But I never felt compelled to see them. So I've kind of seen everybody I wanted to see, you know? Wow. Yeah. Ooh, that's so cool. Um, some comments here. Uh, oh, I love it. Uh, you had really an amazing life i mean he has <laughs> he's just getting warmed up here oh and look at and you're still young uh he's killing me how about ray davies oh just one of the great greats um i think a little overrated i think a little overrated but still very great you can't you can't have written some of the things that he's written and, and not be considered in the upper tier, but I don't go back to Kinks records. I go back to Beatles records. I go back to Beach Boys records. I go back to the things I can sing. I go back to Kinks songs. Like I, I'll always love Waterloo Sunset and a few others, but I don't find myself going back to their records. It's just personal to me. I'm sure a lot of people, you know, love them very Everybody much. Has their own yeah, yeah. I never, I never, I didn't have many Kinks records growing up. There were always Kinks songs I liked. Cool. I like dancing to them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you just wait. Uh, any bands or artists you're currently listening to now, new or old, rediscover? Well, you know, maybe? I think that there is no, to me, there's nobody like Coldplay. I just there are I think that I think Chris Martin is amazing. I really do think he's amazing. Um I love I love their records. Um who else now am I listening to? Yes, I'm listening to a lot of new bands right now and I can't think of their names. I love the clientele. That that might not be considered new to people. I don't know when their last record came out, but I really love their sound. Um 
love their songs. I love bands that not that don't just have one song, but have many. You know, I'm I'm in the old fashioned school of putting on a record and listening all the way through. You know, so I like really I really like uh, bands that have a number of songs that I like, not just one. I'll, I'll listen to one, but they don't become like my personal band if they're not a few. You know what I mean? Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. What do you discover your music? Just like, I mean, is it radio, internet radio, DJ friends? I have to say, uh, I listen to Sirius Radio. Um, it's a funny thing. Um, my album is being featured on The Loft, on Sirius, I think it's, station number 30 or however they designate it and of course um when i'm driving i listen because i want to see i want to hear it come on right mm -hmm. and i just hear a lot of other things that i haven't heard and nice. i'll write it down and if i'm at starbucks and it's a song whatever i just find a way to definitely find it you know Ooh, yeah yeah any way you can it. find new music is uh you gotta you gotta find a way to get it you know mm -hmm. Cool. But you know, uh, there's nothing like going to a record store and finding music the way we once did. Now the record yeah. store is on your computer, and that's great. That's, that's just another way to get it. But right. I liked it when it was palpable, when you could actually, you know, records, you just, they were in a rack, and you looked at it, you, you felt the record. You know, you saw a picture, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. I know I was never wrong when I picked up a record that looked like I know I I cherish it and it never failed. I was never right? wrong. Yes. Very true. And it also it mattered how much money you had at the time. You know, cuz I knew that like buying a record was like if it was you know $7 or $6 whatever it was, I couldn't I couldn't get 3 of them. $18. That was a I, lot, you know. So you really I, had to choose the records you bought, you know. <laughs> or you can bring a paper bag with one of your parents' old records and switch them because you're getting something and giving something back. Okay. Right. <laughs> but again, I cherished everyone. Yes. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> I just totally, I'm in so much trouble now. Uh, oh. Oh, here's one. Um, you also collaborated with Eric Carmen. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes, I I was working at a publishing company and I was 23 years old and I looked at the Rolodex of the person's desk that I was sitting at and Eric Carmen's name came up and I said, you know what, I'm going to call him. And he picked up the phone. It's the early 80s. And he said, listen, if you're ever in Cleveland, come by my apartment. So I, my dad was taking a business trip to Cleveland. I said, dad, let me come with you. I knock on Eric Carmen's door. And we totally hit it off. This is a guy I grew up with. You know, the raspberries, forget about it, right? I mean, they're amazing. And then uh, I said, Eric, like I said to George Harrison, I said, do you want to write a song? He goes, send me a lyric. So I sent him a lyric of a song I wrote called The History of You, based on the history of things we did together. In the mail, a week later, comes a cassette, and he, and he writes a note. He goes, I changed the title to After You. He goes, he said, you're a little too clever for your own good. So I, I simplified. And he made a demo of two or three songs we did. And they're actually on my Facebook page of Eric Carmen singing songs that we wrote together. Oh, my God. And a lot of his fans say, why don't you record those songs? You know, because they really are good. It was very thrilling, as you can imagine. Wow. That is cool. I do love them. <laughs> um. What is the most outrageous uh, CD or album in your collection? Oh, the most outrageous. Oh, that's a great question. I don't know that I have that I have one that I would consider outrageous. Yeah, because to you it might not be. Right? Be to and it might have been at the time, <laughs> and it might have been at the time, but I don't know if I have anything. How would you, what would you consider outrageous? What, what's yours? Uh, I, yeah, right? I don't know what's uh, particularly outrageous. <laughs> as I, as You're I, not supposed to ask me. I know, <laughs> I know. You know, as I say, I like, I was always into very melodic music. So I never looked for the, I was not rebellious. So I never looked for like a Clash record when everybody was, I liked songs of theirs that got to me. But uh, 
I never, I never was attracted to the flame of rebellion, you know, and, and I respect it. Oh my God, I respect it. It's kind of the fuel in many ways that keeps things going. But um, it wasn't the thing that fueled, uh, that, that attracted me. What always attracted me was a great melody, great melodies. And I grew up in a house, not just with current music, but with Broadway music and folk mm. music. Okay. My mother would buy records of the mamas and the papas in the 60s and just great songs. And when I went to bed at night, she would be blasting records till two o'clock in the morning and playing them over and over and over again. So I was like, nice. I would sit up in bed. Everybody was asleep and I would be listening and I would think she's going to play that again. And she always did. And it was, you know, I got those melodies in my head. Man, uh, that's a nice home. Yeah, you're exactly thank you. Where you're supposed to be. Yeah. Uh, so do you have any live shows coming up or you know i always i always end up playing live you know i i'm not alive i i don't it's not part of my thing you know what i'm saying making records is part of my thing and making creating other things but i always end up doing one or two or three or five shows you know what i mean and so I'm thinking about getting a band together and playing circles and squares oh, wow. and a bunch of other solo things. And we'll see, we'll see what the next month or two brings with that. Cool. And you know, there's, there's the internet yes. for those of us that can't travel or. You know what I always yeah. do Lisa, on, on my Facebook page, I always end up picking up a guitar and playing a song here you and know, there. I love that. Yeah. I do love that. It just shows me how, much more talented I wish I were. <laughs> so thank you for that. No, seriously, it's really great stuff. You're you're so broad. It's not just one thing. And you played the whole song. Yeah, I try I try to play the whole song if I can remember the lyrics. As a matter of fact, today, just by coincidence, there was a party I was at a few years ago and Jackson Brown was at the party. And he there were two guitars and they handed one to him and one to me. The host of the party knew us both. I didn't know him. And he starts playing these days. And I played it along with him and I posted it today on Facebook. So it's like those kind of things that are just impromptu or I'll play a Beatles song or I'll play one of my own songs and I'll just post it. So that's what I, yeah. I never, I'm not seeing anyone doing what you do, at least not in my personal news feed. Oh, yeah. You definitely stand out. Oh, it's really inspiring, you. though. It's inspiring, and, and I appreciate it. Thank you. So I don't want us to get cut off. We're at 827. Mm -hmm. If anything happens, we've never gone this long, but you were so fun. Thank so you. I really appreciate you. Um, we you. might have one more thing here in the comments. Uh, da, uh, oh, OK, Randy says, do you like Neil Diamond? I love Neil Diamond. As a matter of fact, the song Cracklin' Rosie in 1969, 70, whenever it was, I begged my mother to go out and buy that song. It was on Uni Records with the colorful label and Neil Diamond, come on. Again, melody, melody. I don't care who does it. I love the Carpenters when it was on Cool. I love, you know, it doesn't matter who does what. I just love music. Cool. And you heard it right here. <laughs> Yay, Seth Swirsky, thank you so much. Thank you for being here. I expect you to come back again. It'll probably be for something not even seen yet. Thank you so, so much. I'm, I'm honored to be asked and thank you, for, thank you for your great questions. They were really, really, this has been really a lot of fun. Yay, and thank you chat room. Those were, yeah. Yes, thank great. you chat room. They said, totally loved hearing your stories. Oh, thank yes. you so much. Cool. All right, everybody. Good night. Big hugs to you, Seth. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye, everybody.